Hi, how's it going, everybody? And welcome to the Day Beautify podcast, the premier e-commerce podcast brought to you by Day Beautify. I'm your host, Alex Bond, and joining me today is Adam Pierce, the co-founder and CEO of Blend Commerce, the e-commerce customer experience agency. Adam and his team have worked with over 200 Shopify retailers to help them provide memorable customer experiences that drive growth in revenue and profit. Adam and I talk about customer value optimization, how to elevate the customer experience, design trends, and much more. Here's our interview now. Adam, welcome to the show. Alex, great to be here. Thanks for having me on the show. Yeah, we're very happy to have you. So look, you have a digital marketing agency that's a little different than other people that I've spoken to in the past. Can you tell me a little bit about your agency, Blend? Yeah, sure. So I guess the big difference with Blend is that there are a lot of agencies out there that will work specifically on things like conversion rate optimization. And that's all good stuff. It's all good work. But what we found is that working with clients over the course of the past sort of seven or eight years is that when it comes to trying to improve the conversion rate to deliver a Shopify store, the problem that a lot of brands have is that they need to have a part, a way of coming up with ideas. And what we do at Blend is that we use something called convert customer value optimization. And what this basically means is that, yes, we do the usual conversion rate optimization activities. But with that, we do a lot of qualitative and quantitative research behind that, that then gives these brands tons and tons of different ideas that we can then implement for them. So that's, I guess, the, the big difference of what we do is that we're kind of a an ideas generator as well as a CRO implementer. Awesome. So can you kind of break down exactly what customer value optimization is a little bit more specifically? Because frankly, for me personally, I never even heard of that you know, strategy or or, or metric until I started to do some research on you guys. So yeah, break, can can you break that down for me a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, look, we're on an e-commerce. We don't really need another acronym, but hey, I'm going to throw it (laughs) onto the part. Essentially what CBO is, customer value optimization, it is about saying for an e-commerce store, five, 10 years ago, the focus was all about, we need to bring customers to the site. We need to get them to convert. We need to get them to buy. And then kind of we left we left them to it. Now, obviously, fast forward, what's happened is everyone knows it's more expensive. It's more difficult to get customers to the site. So if it is more expensive, you need to be doing things on the store that are going to help keep people there for longer. And when I mean longer, what I mean by that is that increasing the lifetime value of that customer. So CVO, what it does is says, okay, in terms of the Shopify store we have right now, when it comes to the on-site marketing, the off-site marketing, what are we doing to give that customer a better experience that's going to mean they're going to come back for the second, third, fourth time, rather than just trying to get them across that credit card payment field for the first time around? So it's more long-term focused than just bring the traffic in, convert them, and then say goodbye. No, I think that makes a lot of sense. So you mentioned already some of the differences between conversion rate optimization or CVO and, I'm sorry, customer value optimization, conversion rate optimization, is one specifically better than the other? Because it sounds like from your experience and the way that Blend has run, you like focusing more on CVO. So, you know, why is that specifically? Yeah, I mean, the way I'd describe it is that CRO is a tool that fits within CVO. So I guess, you know, if we look at it from that perspective, kind of CVO is the umbrella at the top. And then the tools that you've got under that umbrella are one is conversion rate optimization. The other one is qualitative research. So things like jobs to be done surveys, RFM segmentation. And then you've also got then on top of that, then your kind of retention marketing. So things that are connected with email marketing, SMS, all of those kind of sit under CDO. So I guess, you know, what the way we look at it is that, look, we love CRO. We think conversion optimization is great, but it's only actually one of the tools that brand needs to be using when we're kind of in this period whereby actually we need to focus more on the lifetime value of that customer rather than just kind of the here and now and let's get them across the the payment line. And one of the things that I like about at least what I'm hearing you say, CVO, is that it feels kind of like you're treating customers a little bit more individually instead of with broad strokes and as data sets or general demographics. That feels like a more intimate experience. Is is that kind of the point, essentially, is is creating a more human-to-human relationship there? You're bang on the money there, Alex, because I think, you know, look, the the key thing that drives CBO is RFM segmentation. So, hey, another acronym, but recency, 
frequency and monetary for those guys that they haven't heard about before. All that essentially means is that rather than, I guess, kind of, you know, the good old days where we would, you know, say our, our ideal customer is Susan from Ohio, who's got three kids and two dogs. What we're saying is actually now we're looking at how recently did they last buy, how frequently they've purchased, what their monetary value is. And on top of that, what are the things that they've done on site in their marketing that give us different signals? So we actually group customers on that basis and then market to them both from retention marketing and also acquisition marketing based on that. Because I think a lot of brands have, have kind of switched on to this. If you think about the bigger brands now, they are not thinking about you know targeting just that man or woman or whoever, which you know demographic person it is. It's actually the thing that they need to do, the job that they need to do. So, you know, if you think about Apple, for example, you know, Apple's always a good example to look at. The marketing of their iPhone, the most recent one, has actually been um, a mother who's running around the house, trying to tie the house up, get the kids ready for school, go and do a job. They're showing the durability of it. So what they're saying is this is a phone, not necessarily just for a mother, but actually someone who's on the go, who needs that durability, who needs something that's actually going to stay with them and work well under kind of all these different circumstances. And that's kind of, you know, I, I guess that the vein that we're going down here is it's that what do those individual groups need rather than based on, you know, kind of traditional sort of gender stereotypes. Just to add to that, also someone who multitasks or something like that. I, I feel like that's a very, very mother thing Absolutely. to do as well. And Apple's very famous for. So let's say I've been I've been running a a business or a brand and have had a conversion rate optimized mindset is it decently easy to kind of transition into a cvo from a cro or or how complicated is that because i feel like that's what we're gearing up to and again this is something i i hadn't heard before until the day with my very limited knowledge at that but i can imagine that you being customer experience focused are paying attention to market trends customer trends and things like that so it might behoove us to talk about being able to kind of convert, you know, a brand's business model in mid lifetime a little bit. Yeah, I mean, look, it, it's definitely a challenge that we come across when we talk to, to new potential clients because mm -hmm. you know, we, we've had the past ten or fifteen years, everything that we do being obsessed with conversion rate. You know, your site has got to convert at between two point eight and three you know, percent. The usual rhetoric that we kind of you know that everyone hears. But the thing is, when when we actually show clients what we do, we use something called the e-commerce growth formula. And what this basically does is that it takes their core metrics, one of which of course is conversion rate, and then we look at all of the different factors like their gross margin, the purchase frequency, their retention rate, and then we boil that all down into their overall lifetime value number. Now, what this basically shows is that and when we play around the numbers, for example, if you increase your conversion rate by 10%, this is the impact it's going to have on LTV. If you increase your AOV by 10%, this is the impact you'll have on your LTV. So what it does very quickly is it shows in some instances that conversion rate isn't actually the key driver for the long-term health of the business. And that's kind of the way that we approach it. Of, you know, because ultimately we have a job, like you said, Alex, you know, no one's really heard of CVO yet. So we we are in this position where we have to show people and educate people why this is a worthwhile way of thinking. I think, you know, look, clients that, that come on with us who get it immediately, that's great. But what you've always got is that, you know, I was talking to a brand the other day, a big UK-based drinks brand. They've got four or five people in the meeting. Someone is coming from an acquisition perspective. Someone's coming from retention perspective. Someone's coming from a commercial perspective. And someone's coming from a brand perspective. That when it, it becomes difficult because everyone has got a slightly different opinion of what the most important metric is. But what we have to do is show them with CBO, there's actually something for everyone in that number. And ultimately, it is, you know, it is about the margin and the ratio of that LTV number to the cost of acquisition. So ultimately, those two things, it doesn't matter whether you're acquisition, commercial, retention side, there's going to be something in it for you. Rather than, I guess, you know, with CRO Pure, where it's like, right, it's all about conversion. It's all about getting them from meta to the site and getting them to convert. It's really fascinating. So I appreciate you educating me on this. And I don't mean to totally beat it to death. But one of the things that I read is it's about growing that relationship with the client over time. So, you know, customer value 
doesn't exactly mean how great is our relationship to this specific customer or this type of customer. It's how great can it be? And I think Mm. those are kind of two interesting distinguishing factors. It's not kind of like judging where we're at. It's judging what we can or should be. Is that accurate? Absolutely. So it's definitely about looking ahead. In terms of the actual implementation, the things you can do, I guess kind of the way of thinking is that, look, if if you, let's take, I guess, kind of a typical, you know, Shopify store that is focused on conversion optimization, and then a store that is focused on CBO. And for example, let's take an apparel brand. Now, most apparel brands, if it's CRO focus, what's going to happen is you're going to go to the site and at some point they're going to try and get you to sign up to their mailing list. And to do that, what they'll do is they'll give you a 10% discount by signing up. That's the typical kind of play that we you would have. If you were thinking about a CVO play, what you'd be thinking about here is that when that customer comes to site, we need to do a couple of things here. One, we need to gauge interest, which is what CRO does. But secondly, what other data can we extract from that customer to then potentially retain them for a longer period? So rather than maybe a 10% offer for sign up, there will maybe be a pop up which takes to an on site quiz. It would ask you about your favorite colors. It would ask you about your size. It would ask you about brands that you liked. And then off the back of that, then it would recommend you on screen a number of different products that fit exactly what you're looking for. All that data then will go over to your email platform. We use Clavio, obviously either is available, but what Clavio would then do is personalize your welcome flow by only showing you products that were in your size, in the colors that you want, using the brands that you want. So that, I guess, for me, is, is a good way to kind of explain the difference in the mindset is that you're playing from the outset to have that customer as a long-term customer to sell more to rather than a pure, right, let's get the email address. Let's just try and sell, 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 product, product, product. And that's why there is a little bit of resistance sometime because it feels like a longer play and it is, but ultimately it's one that's going to be more profitable for that business, particularly when, you know, cost for acquisition is, is so, so high at the moment. Because it sounds like you got to, you got to add all of these systems and processes to better understand an individual customer, which I could imagine smaller brands are going to have to pay for or put extra work into, which is a long-term play when honestly, probably from my experience and discussions with people, people in the first year or two are just trying to not shutter the doors a little bit. You know, they're they're just trying to make sure that they can make enough to keep running so I can, I can kind of understand people's hesitance there. I wanted to talk about the nitty gritty a little bit in terms of specifically what services that blend provides. So we we provide to our clients our managed CBO service. So what does that actually mean? Well, okay. it will usually start out that we will tend to do a pretty significant audit of everything that's happening in that business. So looking at obviously the metrics for the store, the design of the store, how users are experiencing it, the marketing of that business. And from that then, what we'll say is, right, here is a list of priorities of things that you guys need to do on site. And we'll prioritize those using something called the PECTI framework. And all that basically means is that we're prioritizing on how, how easy something is and what the impact of it is and then how effective we think that's going to be. So that's the first step. After that, then, on a month-to-month basis, what we'll be doing is starting with the highest priority task. And you know, that might be, for example, something as significant as redesigning the product page. It might be actually something as minimal of actually changing the configuration of a couple of apps. So we're working through those, and then month-to-month, what we're doing, we're tracking back and saying, right, based on the changes that we've made here, what have been the impact on the metrics that form LTV. So for some clients, it might be, look, we're looking at seeing an uplift in conversion rate because that's the most important metric to drive LTV. Others AOV, others purchase frequency. And in terms of implementation, we obviously do the design work, the development work, and also work on the email and SMS marketing as well. So not only is it, okay, the analysis at the start, it's then implementation, tracking back to that, and then continually helping to reprioritize what is most important and what's working. So it's kind of something you know, that, that ebbs and flows, it moves. It's not just, you know, kind of clients come in, we have a list of things we're going to do, and then we do them over six months. That list will change. 
because we'll see different things happening. We'll have different priorities and it's just a bit more kind of free flowing in that respect. And I like kind of that you have your arm in these different camps of what I'm, what I'm hearing is design, marketing, and growth development. So it's it's nice that, you know, you can't just blame one of those other things because you're kind of helping all three of those. You, you, you design the site, so it's not like, it's not doing as well as it should. And a client's like, um, hey, the, the design you did isn't, isn't really working. And you go, oh, that's the marketing agency that you, you can't really pass the buck is what I'm trying to say. Was that by design and how you started the company? No, not at all. I mean, look, me and my business partner started an agency the way most dumb agency owners do. And they sit around a table and go, hey, we can do an AB, an agency that does everything. We'll do SEO, we'll do PPC, we'll do design. And then you, know, you kind of realize after about three months that you're not a magician. You would actually also like to be able to sleep at night. And you kind of sort of, you sort of start niching down. And to answer Alex, look, for, for the first you know year or so, that's what we did. And we were just like, look, we can't do this. So we then moved into kind of just doing development work and design work. And then as time went on, Shopify, when we started, was kind of its infancy. Brands obviously got bigger and we need to be more flexible. So we kind of went to a monthly retainer model. So, hey, here's a list of things. Go and do them. We'll report back. Um, And then, yeah, about 18 months ago, we were like, look, again, the market's changing. The brands are changing in what they need. There was a shift because of everything that was happening with Facebook and Meta and iOS and all this stuff. And it was like, actually, this kind of acquisition, cheap traffic heyday is going. We need to have something that's more long-term focused. And yeah, as I say, about 18 months ago, we kind of switched to this mentality of, of CVO. One of the things that I, I appreciate about essentially your brand's pitch is that it's described as a customer experience agency in terms of services you provide for clients. So what made you decide that that customer experience should be your foundation instead of something very simple that a lot of places do, which is you know growth or sales or marketing? What was the decision there? A lot of that was really down to what we were hearing from both existing clients um, and also prospects when we were kind of talking to them in, in calls. Because I think prior to that period, we had this kind of boom of drop shipping, you know, five, six, seven years ago. And in that time, everyone was very product focused. It's all about how do we increase sales for now? Um, what do we do with the site to increase conversion on this particular product? And then you start getting these brands that start doing very well with kind of things like community building and um, getting them to be longer term customers. And because of that, we then said, well, actually, our clients are asking us about this. Well, what do we do about these customers who, you know, have only bought from us once? We keep seeing this trend that people buy a second product and then they, they go away. And what we brought that down to is that it was actually what that customer experience was about. We knew Clavio, We knew it very well. We knew design, we knew development. So we just said, actually, we need to now, rather than just go down this kind of very, you know, focused, right, get them in, get them converting, build out actually for a customer a better experience on site that's then going to give our current customers and these prospects what they want to hear. So rather than saying, look, we're going to increase your conversion rate from 3% to 4%, you know, what we'd be saying is, look, what we're going to do is actually make sure that the customers that are dropping off at the third purchase don't drop off. And we're going to do that with a combination of different landing pages, email marketing, SMS. So it, in all honesty, it, it was plain to what the, you know, what the market wanted to hear. No, that's that's pretty special. And, and I think that what you've tapped into is trying to figure out what the customer wants a little bit more when that's your priority, honestly, is I feel like you end up learning more about the customer. So I know that this is already going to be a difficult question, but in, in extremely general terms, what has your experience shown that customers value when wanting to develop a relationship between a brand and a customer? I think it's a really good point. And what I would say on that is that customers, in my mind, and what we've seen is that they want to know that the brand that they're dealing with is speaking directly to them. I have a bit of a problem with the term personalization. It automatically makes you think of this like creepy email saying, hey, Adam, buy this stuff. I only saw them, but I didn't, luckily. Um, the, the thing for me is, though, is that when you think about relationships that the best brands build, 
it starts off by, first of all, them getting information from that customer. So it's about, for example, making sure that when you have a site, what you're doing is that you are giving them an easy way to navigate around the site. Main thing with most Shopify stores is the navigation sucks. If you can sort your navigation out, you're onto a winner straight away. So showing the customer you're there for them. The second thing is then, if you can use zero-party data, so things like you know using a quiz, having a pop-up that asks for more than just an email address or, or a name, that then enables you to then go and personalize the experience that they then get from an email or SMS perspective. For me, it's just about making sure that anything that goes to that customer, whether it be on-site or via your marketing, is giving them relevant information relevant products to them that is actually going to give them something new to think about or an idea rather than it just being right sell product 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 so two-way communication in your marketing two-way communication on your site things like having little mps surveys brilliant because what it means is that again you can get the you know the kind of sense checker for for where people are feeling about the site far too often you know look I've been in marketing for 15 odd years. I think, you know, when I started, it was very much like marketing was kind of a broadcast channel. There was this confusion between marketing and advertising. And I think what a lot of the smart companies realize is that marketing has always been about a conversation, about data going both ways. And that's how I think the best Shopify brands are winning. I think that's extremely valuable. And look, it, it sounds like if BuzzFeed's taught us anything, it's that people love taking quizzes. And if, you know, thousands of years of, of human sociology and psychology has told us anything, it's that people love talking about themselves. So it's also like, all you have to do is put it out there and people are practically giving you free increase in sales. You just have to give them the option of these pop-up quizzes and things like that. And it's extremely valuable, you know, and, and you already touched on, on one thing. And that's essentially that, you know, you specialize in Shopify design among it's made on, among your many services, which makes sense because of the customer experience being your forte. So what are those specific design problems, the big ones that you see in Shopify stores that could lead to lower than projected sales? By far, product page. Product pages are always poorly designed. I think the problem is that there's kind of two general extremes of product pages. One is that some brands view the product page as a place where people are simply going to check out. And what they believe is that actually all the information, the great information that is on your homepage, on your about us page, about things like guarantees, how the product's made, where the product's made, celebrities that have used that product should stay elsewhere. And you get this very bland product page, which has, you know, frankly, a very poor product description and buy now. Now, the thing is, 99% of ads that we see running to sites go to that product page. So for me, it'd be like, you know, I've got a house that I'm renovating. I've done up the living room that's all fancy with a beautiful sofa. And I've taken them out the back to the kitchen that is still some 1960s awful kitchen. Why would you do that? Why would you take someone? Gaudy wallpaper and everything. Exactly. <laughs> and, and that's, that's you know, the, the simple thing. Like people send it to the product page and they're like, yeah, but we've got a beautiful homepage. Your customer coming from Facebook doesn't care. They're not clicking around. They're making that decision in about three seconds. They look at your product page and go, ah, this is terrible. So I think that's the, the one extreme. The Especially not not to cut you off too much, but but because I personally go to the homepage anyway, no matter where an ad sends me, I end up just clicking the logo and going back to the homepage because I'm not going to buy a product if I don't even know about your company off the bat. Exactly. And I guess that's the thing that's you what you're looking for there is you are trying to do that due diligence on that company in your mind about whether they're trustworthy, whether the product's any good, whether actually you desire it. And you need all of those factors shown to you on the homepage in a very neat and concise way. So you want to be able to get that information in. And, and it, you know, it really does tend to be very poorly executed. But on the other hand, you get the other side where everything is very over-engineered. And I'm sure people have seen this. You go to a site, and particularly sites that do subscriptions are appalling at this. It's like build a bundle, subscribe and save now. Subscribe and save for a month, subscribe and save for three months, subscribe and save for 12 months. And you get this, this some product pages where it's like there are four or five different options, and that's even before you've selected the product and the cadence you want it on. Then you get to how you're going to pay. 
you can use Klarna, you can use Afterpay, you can use Chuck, and it has all, all these different options. So I think for me, it's there's lots of times when if you don't design the product page, either you over design it, you over, you know, increase the functionality too much, you put people off. And secondly, if you don't do enough, you kind of left in no man's land. So for me, that that product page, it's got to be clear. It's got to give the the right feels that your homepage will give. And it's got to have a very clear process of buying that product. Don't need overcomplication of actually what that process is going to be to buy the product. Sounds like it's a lot of involvement and balance there. I read in one of your case studies on, on your website that you installed a heat map essentially onto your client's website to understand more specifically how customers were were navigating their page and what improvements could be made on the site. Is that something that you guys typically do with your clients or do you use that as kind of a proverbial black light to help you find a problem that might be harder to see, you know? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's definitely used as that kind of way to kind of illuminate some of the things that are there because the, the usual process would be is that, look, our UI UX team will go through the site and say, right, from a best, be, be, the best practice perspective, there are some things here we can see already that just simply shouldn't be shouldn't be the case. But then what you do is, ultimately, that is, you know, a hypothesis in the head about best practice. We all know about best practices. They are the best practice known at that period for a group, but it doesn't work for everyone. So you put those heat maps on site and you do two things. One is that you either clarify or actually you get rid of that hypothesis that the team has had about the site that something isn't working. The second thing you do is that you always find stuff that you'd never even thought about. And it's things like, for example, you know, you will have a very random small call to action button on a homepage that is taken to a blog, which then actually has people exiting from the site. What a lot of the time happens is that that has been put on there as a bit of a, a nice to have, but it actually then goes and kills your conversion rate because you're navigating someone to a piece of content that isn't relevant. So it's all these little bits and pieces that you find out from doing that heat mapping. You know, and when you've got that significant level of traffic, it's well worth doing that as kind of an you know, initial step to work out where you are. When you've got a lower level of traffic, look, you, you need to rely on best practices. But you know, when you're certainly, you know, getting up to those, you know, sort of thousands of thousands of views each day, heat mapping, absolutely must. You want to make the most out of every single user and, and, and their trends. So speaking of trends, I imagine, again, being in customer experience, that's something that is continuously changing and evolving is where and how customers are comfortable, you know, navigating a website. So where do you see design trends going in terms of customer experience? Yeah, I mean, the thing for me is that, you know, if, if we think about two things, one, generally the way people are shopping, and secondly, in terms of kind of Gen Z and the way that they're shopping, because they okay. are going to be, you know, one of the most profitable sections to sell to. Generally speaking, I think that during the pandemic, there was a real big change in expectations from companies. Customers were expecting uh, companies to communicate with them on multiple channels. They're expecting them to deliver to them, give them lots of different delivery options. So the expectation of what an online store can do and how you can communicate them is vastly different to what it was maybe three or four years ago. So in terms of the trend, brands that are using things like obviously like they have their Shopify store, but then for all different types of customers, they're using Amazon. They've also got the ability to shop via TikTok. They've got the ability to shop via Instagram and customers will bounce around these different channels depending on where they are. From a marketer's point of view, that's a headache because, you know, we in marketing, look, we love silos, don't we? You know, that's the Instagram traffic. That's the Shopify store traffic. Well, unfortunately, customers aren't playing ball in that way anymore. They'll go wherever they want to be. So from a design point of view, all of your different sales channels need to have this consistent feel about them. And when I say consistent feel, yes, it's the branding, but it's also that experience that they're going to get. So if, for example, you are selling, you know, a product that gives you subscribe and save, you're going to want to be offering that on the Shopify store. You're also going to want to give, be given that opportunity on Instagram. And if they decide one day when they're flicking through Instagram that they want to change their subscription, you're going to need to give them the ability from Instagram to get through and change that. But they, they, they get frustrated 
when they can't communicate you in the ways that they want to. So I think that's the first one. On the Gen Z thing, I think, you know, look, again, the thing is here is that Gen Z are a lot more informed. Their expectations are very high of brands. They have a very high awareness of, um, I think, kind of social responsibility of companies. And I think a lot of brands at the moment haven't quite caught up to where their kind of standards will be. So again, from a design point of view, we used to talk about trust indicators. So, you know, things like, for example, guarantees, shipping times, all those kind of things. With Gen Z, that's still there, but you also need to think about things now that are, you know, related specifically to the carbon footprint of that product, the impact of your delivery, sustainability efforts that are happening within the business. So all of those things also need to come into your trust indicators for your product rather than just, you know, look, made in the USA, handcrafted, all those things we would have used maybe, you know, again, five, six, seven years ago are changing in terms of what people want to see on that product page. Luxury and things that are, you know, pitching points are now expected is kind of what I'm hearing you say, Adam. And and, and frankly, you know, it, it, it blows my mind to actually think about it, but Gen Z would actually be in the kind of like disposable income bracket in about, you know, a dozen years, 10, 10 to 15 years time only. Now, now that I'm really thinking about it, it makes, makes me feel old, but <laughs> they would be that signal market at about, you know, 30 to 40 in 10 to 15 years. And if this trend keeps moving in that direction, then people are going to expect and really have to cater to that personalized experience. I also wanted to mention that you also host a podcast, co-host an e-commerce collaboration club, co-founded a company to help e-commerce events and partnerships, and have spoken at numerous engagements. So, you know, from from my perception, clearly developing relationships is important to you, and, and you have an acumen for it. Just that I could see in this conversation is is that something that you've always understood to be valuable and had a skill for, or was that something that you had to develop over time? Yeah, I think, look, you know, I, like a lot of people in e-commerce, you know, I didn't start out in e-commerce when I, when I left school, you know, I went to work for a consultancy company. I went to be a teacher. I've done quite a few different things before I landed in e-commerce. And I think, you know, one thing that I love in e-commerce is that we don't have this old boys club. You know, I have a lot of friends that kind of work in the banking sector. And I think, you know, there is a very different situation. You've got people with 20 or 30 years experience beyond you, and you can never kind of you know, get into this sort of weird cliquey inner circle. I think I've kind of embraced that in e-commerce because that's what I love about it. But also we were very fortunate kind of coming into Shopify at the time that we did because it was it, you know, it was a it pretty much a brand new company. People were new to it. They were still figuring it out. People are still figuring it out. You know, it's ebbed and flowed and changed. And there are different parts of it that didn't exist, obviously, a few years ago. And I think, you know, ultimately, by being open and by having some good relationships with our competitors, you know, with tech brands, with, with actually brands themselves, um, it's a lot, it, a, it's a nicer, nicer way to work, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis for me. Um, because, you know, everything is more direct, it's more upfront, you know, you don't get people kind of speaking in loops like you do in, in other kind of industries. And I think, you know, ultimately I, I find e the e-commerce world very collaborative. Uh, and what I mean by collaborative is, you know, people genuinely helping other people because they want to, and also not this kind of feeling of, you know, you, you never get obviously going to get Coca-Cola talking to PepsiCo about different strategies, but in e-commerce, I see it all the time. You know, I see big brand leaders talking openly to other Shopify brands about what their plans are and what they're going to do. And it's it's refreshing. And, you know, long may it continue. I love that outlook. And, and frankly, I just want to add that e-commerce is still decently young. So there's not a lot of room for, you know, total 100% shaman mentors in this industry yet. And frankly... There's not a lot of room for ego. So if you're if if you're in an industry that is consistently evolving, no one's going to want to work with the guy who knows it all, especially if he knows it all today and it's all useless five years from now because it's so quickly changing. So I, I, I think that what you're saying has a lot of value to people in terms of collaborative effort of it all. And look, it, it's a, it's a lot to have going on between blend podcast 
Flabo clubs and all this other stuff. And so I, I think that's really cool how involved you stay with that community and that it's kind of tete-a-tete at the same time. It's not just, you know, you go speak to other people, but that you're also on the other side of the coin and, and, and going through that learning process as well. So I wanted to also ask with all this busyness, e-commerce is generally 24 seven. I always end episodes with this question. It's extremely important to have a healthy work-life balance stable mental health, which is extremely difficult in this industry, especially when you've got as many things going on as yourself. So what are your hobbies and interests that you practice in your free time to retain your sanity, Adam? Yeah, I mean, I'll echo that, Alex. Look, I I have suffered with with quite significant mental health issues in the past, um, and I still manage depression with things like cognitive-based therapy, and I also medicate for it as well. So anyone who is you know, struggling with that and ever wants to have a chat about that, find me on LinkedIn. I've got some great strategies for coping with it. But I think, look, outside of work, you know, two important things for me is one is my very young family. So I've got um, two little girls, one who's four and one who's 18 months, um, you know, and that's that's kind of, you know, what keeps you going. And sometimes, you know, when you've, you've had a really hard couple of weeks, you kind of realise what you're doing it for. And I guess, you know, from a, from a more... I guess, uh, salvage perspective, I'm a massive craft beer fan and I love street food. So my my ultimate dream, and I will do this one day, is, you know, the show, is it Diners, Drives and... Diners, Drive-Ins and Dives. That's the one. I basically want to go through all those episodes, find all the best places, and then take a car through the States and then Oof. go and drop it off and eat and drink to my heart's content. I mean, I'll probably be very overweight by the end of it, but hey, it'll be worth it. I'll, I'll tell you what, Adam, if if you like street food and craft beer, you would love Richmond. Richmond, Virginia is, is where I'm reporting live from. There is a crazy craft beer scene here. So we might, might have to get you out here, man. Where are you from? So we are in a place called Ulster, which is not far from Stratford, Penavon. So it's kind of like, you know, we have a lot of um, Shakespeare in, inspired business names around here. Um, a lot gotcha. of tourists. Um, but yeah, it's it's a nice place to be. That's great, man. We'll have to, um, maybe I'll have to come across the pond. You'll have to come across the pond one, one way or the other. But I really appreciate your your honesty and humility. And thanks for coming on the show, man. Absolute pleasure. Thank you, Alex. I'd like to thank my guest, Adam Pierce, for joining me on the show and tune in on Thursday when I sit down with Drew Marconi, the CEO and co-founder of a SaaS company called Intelligems. Drew and I talk about price testing, how to fight inflation, and common misconceptions about pricing. For more information about Adam, you can connect with him on LinkedIn. And for more information about Blend Commerce, you can check out their website, blendcommerce.com, or their podcast hosted by Adam called Shopify Across the Pond, wherever you get your podcasts. That's our show. Thanks for joining us, and we hope you come back to find new episodes being published every Tuesday and Thursday. Until next time.